Between the broad expanses of agricultural land in the southern part of America and the rocky, storm-tossed coasts of New England, there lay a large, fertile, undeveloped area which became known as the Middle Colonies, linking north and south and possessing many of the best features of both. Great natural harbors were one striking advantage of this area, as well as many well-placed rivers and lakes. Eventually, the land was divided into four colonies, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Delaware. Only two of these colonies were originally settled by the English. The English were making much headway in colonizing to the north and to the south in an effort to gain control of as much coastal land as possible. Pennsylvania and New Jersey were settled by Englishmen, but Delaware was founded by colonists from Sweden, and New York was for a long time the exclusive property of Holland. Eventually, as she did with the French territorial claims in America, England pushed her Dutch competitors into the sea. But the Dutch left their stamp on the area they had settled, and this heritage remains to this day. About the same time that the English were establishing American colonies, the Dutch became interested in the New World. Although by tradition a great seagoing people, the Dutch had been suppressed for many years because of religious differences and terrible persecutions by Spanish Catholics. Recently freed from Spanish rule, the Dutch were a great European sea power. Ships from Holland sailed every ocean and the sea world over, and Dutch captains were engaged in every kind of trade imaginable, some of them establishing extremely profitable trading centers on the African coasts, where they dealt in slaves, gold, and precious uncut gems. Many Dutch ships ventured far across the seas in search of new lands and new sources of trade goods. Dutch ships traded the world over. Already they were conquering the East Indies. A very advantageous trade arrangement was made here, from which the Dutch profited handsomely on such eagerly sought goods as raw pearls, tea, copra, and rare woods. Opportunity for profit seemed likely in the New World. After much consideration and discussion, a company was formed, much like the London Charter Company, for the investment of interested speculators. In 1609, an English sailor, Henry Hudson, was hired by the Dutch West India Company to explore the New World. In spite of early explorations by Portuguese seamen, who had found ways to reach the Indies by sailing east by way of Africa, or west by way of the route around the tip of South America, the idea persisted among mariners that there still existed some kind of strait which would lead them through the American continents to the east and its treasures. Henry Hudson was no exception. When he reached the northern coastline of North America, he turned south, hugging the coast, moving slowly and carefully. Working his way down the coast, Hudson hoped to find a water passage to the Pacific. In his small ship, the Half Moon, he carefully explored likely-looking inlets and small rivers, but all proved disappointing. Hudson was sure he had found the water route to the west when he discovered New York Harbor. One of the largest natural harbors in the world, it led to a great wide body of water which ran in a northerly direction. He sailed up the broad river that bears his name today, salt water for 120 miles. On either side, the tall, gray, imposing cliffs of the Palisades loomed over the ship. The river widened deceptively for several miles. Hudson believed that soon it would turn westward in its course, and that all he would have to do was keep following it, and he would eventually reach the far Pacific. But near the present site of Albany, Hudson was disappointed to find his great northwest passage was only a river for the Hudson River gradually narrowed and became more and more shallow until it was obvious that the ship could proceed no further. Hudson sailed back to Holland to report his discoveries, and because of his exploratory journey into the inland regions, Holland laid claim to all the land on either side of the river, calling it New Netherland. On a later voyage, Hudson and his young son were marooned by mutinous sailors in the Arctic Bay, which bears his name. The sailors, who had been more and more reluctant as the days and weeks went by, and Hudson commanded them to sail further and further into the great frozen wastes near the Arctic Circle, finally refused to continue under his orders. Hudson perished, still searching for the non-existent passage through the continent. A dream which was long in dying, for men were still searching for it for many, many years to come. 
Despite Hudson's tragic fate, the Dutch founded a city called New Amsterdam on Manhattan Island in New York Harbor. Their immediate purpose was to set up a thriving fur trading business with the Indians. The Dutch West India Company also desired to promote and encourage farming. Indians sold Manhattan Island to Peter Minuet, Dutch governor, for $24 worth of goods. The goods consisted of cheap beads and trinkets, bolts of brightly colored cloth, mirrors, combs, small bells, and other items which attracted the unsophisticated Indian's eye. For this, the Dutch received outright ownership of what is now probably the most valuable piece of real estate in the entire world. By 1620, New Amsterdam was the leading city in the Dutch colony named New Netherland. The Dutch, long experienced in the best way to develop a new trading center, lost no time in establishing order and organization within the small settlement. With care and hard work, their efforts were soon paying a nice profit to the settlers and to the company. The economic lifeblood of New Netherland was the fur trade. Peaceful and friendly relations with the Indian tribes of the neighborhood was essential to this business, and Peter Minuet saw to it that the Indians came to know and to trust the Dutch traders. A broader tolerance for all men was soon recognized in the colony, and religious freedom, a rare commodity in any of the American colonies, flourished. To be near the western fur area, Fort Orange, Albany, was founded and soon became the center of that profitable trade. For a long time, this was to be the colony's chief occupation, and later on was to be one of the main causes of dissension between Dutch and English settlers. However, permanent settlers were needed. Land along the Hudson River was granted to patroons, feudal lords. The concessions granted these settlers were amazingly generous. They were to be given their choice of either 16 miles of land on one side of the river or 8 miles on both sides to hold for succeeding generations. This land was tax-exempt for 10 years. 16 miles of land in a strip along the river may not seem like a good deal, but the amazing thing about the offer was that the land might extend to the east or west as far as the owner desired, provided he recompensed the Indians for whatever portion of their property he took over in extending his estates. In this way, the entire upper Hudson Valley was settled by families who remained for many, many years absolute rulers on their own lands long past the Revolutionary War. Along with this absolute rule came power and rights such as those which had existed in England and France during the Middle Ages. These patroons promised to bring 50 families to settle on their lands. The people who came with them to America were not much better than serfs, forced to remain on the land generation after generation, paying part of their crops as taxes to the patroon, and forbidden to purchase the land they lived on and worked on, no matter how long they might be there. But European feudalism did not take root in America. New Netherland remained small. Once the patroons established themselves along the river, there was not much available land left to encourage new settlers to come in, and the situation remained static for some time. On the other hand, early in its history, New Amsterdam was a cosmopolitan city. Many different nationalities lived there. The Dutch were hospitable and tolerant of all. Businesses thrived. For a time, there was peace and quiet, but eventually trouble began with rival colonies. The Dutch proved aggressive neighbors. They quarreled with English Puritans in Connecticut. The issue was the fur trade in the interior. The English also bitterly resented the presence of the affluent foreign Dutch colony in their midst. Their presence presented them with undesired competition as well as splitting their mainland colonies in two. The Dutch also desired to get rid of their Swedish neighbors in nearby Delaware. Under the leadership of the famous one-legged governor, Peter Stuyvesant, the Dutch attacked Swedish settlements in Delaware. In the year 1655, the Dutch marched south and forcibly annexed several of the settlements at the mouth of the Delaware River. Sweden had founded a colony in Delaware. The Swedes were the first to build the famous American log cabin. Anxious to preserve their small possessions and to continue making inroads on the Dutch fur trade, the Swedish settlers put up a fierce resistance to the invasion force. The Dutch were too powerful, and Sweden had to surrender its Delaware colony in 1655. It had not been a long campaign for the Dutch, and they simply swallowed up Delaware as another part of New Netherland. 
the Dutch were soon to share Sweden's fate. War broke out in Europe between England and Holland. In 1664, the long-standing hostilities reached a boiling point in the colonies as well. England sent a fleet to New Netherland under the Duke of York, brother of King Charles I. Later, the leader of the force was to become King James II. The fleet sailed right into New York Harbor, meeting little opposition from the stunned Dutchmen. Although the Dutch were hopelessly outclassed, Stuyvesant urged resistance. But, for once, his forceful personality and stern determination did not win the day. Refusing to face the reality of the situation, that the city was in a losing position, Peter Stuyvesant tried to whip the people up to go out and defend their possessions. But the Dutch refused to fight so strong a foe. Therefore, the Dutch surrendered and New Netherland became New York. The continuance and extension of Dutch power in America was ended forever, as England was at last able to tie her scattered colonies together into one unbroken area from north to south. However, New York did not forget its Dutch origin. Dutch was still spoken on the streets of Albany 150 years later. For the most part, the Patroon families in the upper Hudson Valley were left undisturbed by their British conquerors, and even today many places and much old architecture remain as a reminder of New York's Dutch beginnings. Places such as Tappan Zee, Harlem, Bushkill, and Spiten Devil. Under English rule, New York kept its aristocratic atmosphere. Grants of thousands of acres of land were awarded freely. A new era was beginning to dawn on the American colonies. Styles, entertainments, furniture, and social customs began to make New York an early center of culture and refinement. English families intermarried with the Dutch patroon families, New York was noted for its gay society. It was a city of the rich in those days, more than any other settlements in the New World. Great mansions were built all along the fashionable Manhattan streets, which have long since become business areas or run-down slums. Many smart shops, carrying the latest in imported styles, catered to wealthy ladies, and several elegant restaurants and hotels did a thriving business. While New York changed from Dutch to English, a religious group called the Quakers was gaining converts in England. The official church was the Anglican Church or Church of England, which had tried to maintain a middle-of-the-road policy towards other religious groups. But there were numerous dissenting groups which not only rejected the official church, but were also violently and bitterly opposed to one another. The Quakers were a Protestant sect who rejected all pomp and ceremony in religious worship and believed strongly in complete equality for all men. Despite their mild and gentle religion, the Quakers were hated and persecuted during the 17th century. Their main opposition came from the Puritans, who considered certain Quaker beliefs to be heretical. The Puritans believed in the literal word of the Bible, while the Quakers held that in each individual carried within himself a small spark of the divine spirit, which might be called the voice of God within man. William Penn, a wealthy young nobleman, converted to their religion, determined to found a colony in America for the Quakers. At first this seemed an impossible dream, for no one would befriend this strange new sect or invest any money in such an enterprise. Luckily, King Charles II owed Penn money and readily agreed to give land instead of cash. He also considered it a cheap and easy way to rid himself of a group which was causing trouble in the country. Charles Land Grant was generous. It was named Pennsylvania, or Penn's Wood. This area covered land bounded on the north by New York, on the east by New Jersey, and on the south by Maryland. In 1682, Penn and his colonists sailed up the Delaware River and began to build a city. The land they found was beautiful, broad and flat, fertile and promising, much in the way of good farming conditions and excellent grazing land. Penn named his new city Philadelphia, meaning city of brotherly love. From the very beginning, this gentle and remarkable Christian determined that his people who had endured so much for the sake of their faith would grant to all who came within their city's borders the same freedom and peace of mind that they had wished for themselves. The settlers in Pennsylvania treated the Indians fairly and as a result were spared the horrors of Indian wars for many years. At first, suspicious of these strange white men, 
the Indians soon learned that they could trust the Quakers to give them a fair and honest price for their trade goods, and that they were welcomed everywhere they went, openly and without any trace of the contempt and snobbery they had come to expect from the white men. Another reason for Pennsylvania's rapid growth was the complete religious toleration of the colony. The original settlers were joined quickly by many newcomers from other parts of the world, looking for just such a spot to build a new home and a new life. Thousands from western Germany, attracted by cheap land and fleeing despotism and military service, flocked to Pennsylvania. Long forced to endure similar feudal conditions to those suffered by the Dutch settlers under the patroons in New York, the Germans, who were excellent farmers, were desperately anxious to own their own farms and work for themselves rather than for any lord. These Pennsylvania Dutch, actually German, settled the rich farming lands of Lancaster County. Although they were mostly Lutherans, they got along well with their Quaker neighbors, and together they profited from the skillful use of the rich land they had found. Scotchmen from Northern Ireland also migrated to Pennsylvania, where they pushed to the west. But many stayed to make their homes in the green hills of Penn's land, and the population of the colony grew rapidly. By 1725, Philadelphia, although its population was only 30,000, was next to London the largest English city in the world. As New York had grown into a center of fashion and gay society, Philadelphia led the colonies as a center of learning, of public works, of modern institutions, and much literary interest. Other American cities marveled at Philadelphia's paved streets, its hospital, asylum, and college. A voluntary fire department was established. Benjamin Franklin, who had been born in Boston, moved to Philadelphia in 1723 and soon began to contribute his knowledge and skills to the city in a variety of ways, including the founding of the first subscription library in the colonies, the first hospital, and the academy which developed into the University of Pennsylvania. The prosperity of Pennsylvania hurt the neighboring colony of New Jersey, founded in 1664. For a long time, New Jersey hung back behind the other rapidly progressing middle Atlantic colonies, remaining small in population and comparatively poor in income. Lack of good harbors hindered New Jersey's development. An agricultural colony, most of its produce passed through New York or Philadelphia. Everything had to be shipped overland, on wagons, which was time-consuming and cut down the profit margin considerably. Despite this marketing problem, New Jersey's fertile acres grew wheat, corn, and varied products. The great natural beauty and harmonious surroundings of the area, which today remain very much in evidence in spite of the large number of factories operating throughout the state, caused New Jersey to be called the Garden State. New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Delaware were the most diversified of the American colonies. Rich farmland, excellent harbors, and a healthy mixture of many peoples led to steady and sometimes spectacular growth. It was to these states that many thousands of future immigrants would first come to live, and the steady stream of newly arrived skilled and willing laborers constantly added to the development and cosmopolitan atmosphere surrounding them. With the acquisition of Dutch New Netherland and its annexed colony of Delaware, England was able to extend its power and economic empire all along the Atlantic seaboard. Now its only rivals on the American continent were France and Spain. France was the next to be driven out, but Spain clung to her North American claims much longer, and it remained for the Americans, once there was a country called America, to finally consolidate their territories and make a last settlement with Spain. Once this settlement with Spain was established, there lay before settlers, from ocean to ocean, 3,000 miles of rich and promising land.